Hello, everyone, and welcome to another another edition of our uh, great educational webinar series. We'll get started here in a moment. I just want to let everyone know that all of your audio on your end has been muted. So if you do have any questions, please do uh, type those into the chat box as all the audio on your end has been muted. This is intended to kind of be a general overview of what UBIT and UDFI are and how they apply to uh, IRA investments and the like. So do keep in mind this is uh, going to be more of a uh, high level uh, kind of overview of everything, but if you do have some specific questions or would like a little bit more information, you can certainly always contact me directly and we can see how something might apply to your specific situation. <clears throat> With that said, let's go ahead and get started. My name is Alex Perney. I've worked with Advana since 2012. I've been involved in over in well over 1,200 individual client transactions in my time as an account manager here at Advanta. So I did kind of start out my career in actually processing and helping structure investments for clients. So I've seen quite a few of these deals be put together and kind of how uh, these types of taxes might apply into specific deals. So if you do have a question on something rather specific or investment specific to you or something that you'd like a little bit of more information on, please don't hesitate to type that into the chat box. It might certainly help someone else get a little bit more uh, understanding of what they're actually doing. If you would like to contact me directly, my direct contact information is up on the screen as well. But for those of you that are just listening to the recording, my number directly is 727-754-9954, or you can reach me at A-P-E-R-N-Y-A-Perny at AdvantaIRA.com. Now, very important to this particular topic is Advanta IRA and our employees do not provide investment or investment or tax advice and all information and materials are provided for educational purposes only. All parties are encouraged to consult with their attorneys, accountants, and financial advisors before entering into any type of financial investment. A little bit about a background of Advanta. We have almost 20 years of industry experience starting back in 2004. Any and all cash deposits here are FDIC insured, and we're very proud to announce that we just recently crossed the milestone of crossing over $2 billion of client assets under administration here at Advanta. If you have any questions, we do have a dedicated account management staff and highly educated staff as well, comprised of industry professionals and certified IRA services professionals with the American Banking Association. So Again, please do, please, I encourage you to ask questions as it does certainly help to enrich the experience for anyone that is listening in today. Now, some important things to understand, and there is some kind of information out there that certain accounts are completely exempted from UBIT and that, or UDFI, and that certainly is not the case. So plans that can potentially be subjected to this type of tax. And we'll get into specifically what UDFI and what UBIT are is there again is some confusion around specifically what they are and the terms get in, or specifically UBIT gets interchanged with when people are actually trying to refer to UDFI a lot. So things like traditional IRAs, Roth IRAs, SEP, simple IRAs can all certainly have these types of taxes levied against them. And unfortunately, without some specific investment structures, there isn't any kind of account exemption for IRA accounts specifically to these types of taxes. So if you are going to be entering into an investment that potentially has one of these types of taxes applied to it, utilizing traditional Roth, SEP, or simple IRAs isn't going to offer you as much of an easy route to uh, exempt yourself from these taxes as uh, things like a solo for 401k or other types of qualifying retirement plans might offer. Also keep in mind that UBIT and UDFI taxes are applicable to health savings and education savings accounts as well. I do see someone uh, raise their hand. Please keep in mind that uh, if you uh, ha do have a question, you need to type that in. Uh, hand raises aren't necessarily uh, uh, kind of hard for me to track in doing this. So if you do have a question, type it into the chat box. I am happy to answer those as they come up. So again, important to understand what types of accounts can potentially be subjected to these types of taxes uh, when you are looking at uh, making a particular investment, whether it be into some type of private equity or into some type of uh, deal that might involve debt on it as well. So let's start by understanding what UBIT taxes and IRAs are. So UBIT is a tax levied when an IRA receives income from a trader business rather than passive investment income. Now, a lot of people will ask the question, uh, Dean, yeah, you're not going to see anyone else's names um, or, or questions in the chat. It's going to be something that uh, I am going to monitor on my side. You won't see that pop up on your end. So understanding what UBIT is. Now, UBIT is kind of a broad term to associate with 
taxes that are associated to investments that are outside the scope of a tax shelter or a tax exempt entity's main purpose. Now, that's all well and good to kind of understand the technical scope of what that defines, but at least for IRAs, UBIT specifically refers to business income that an IRA might receive. Now, what is business income? So a lot of people, when it comes to self-directed IRAs, like to invest into uh, private entities, something that would be like investing into a single member LLC. A lot of people like to call that checkbook control. Now, I wouldn't necessarily go so far as to say automatically, yes, this is something that is going to be subjected to UBIT because a lot of people would just see this as an extension of the IRA and are using it for more of a mechanical advantage when investing with an IRA with how they administer different aspects of how the IRA operates and not necessarily something that gets into an active trader business. If you're just opening up something like an LLC for checkbook control where the IRA is the sole member and it's going to buy, let's say, a piece of real estate or two and just hold it for passive income, I would really hesitate to say that that would be getting anywhere near close to what would be considered active business income. Now, <clears throat> let's say for the sake of argument, that same IRA invests into an LLC uh, that's taxed as a pass-through and that LLC owns a coin laundromat or owns something like a dry cleaners or a convenience store or a company that goes out and fixes road signs, something that is an active trader business, something that has employees and operates in a more traditional fashion. Well, in that case, yes, something like UBIT would apply, which would be a tax on the income over and above what the actual basis in the investment is. So the return on the investment income might be subjected to UBIT if that particular investment is not taxed as a C-Corp. Now, in the previous slide, I mentioned that IRAs specifically have a lot more opportunities to be subjected to UBIT than other types of accounts, namely qualified retirement plans and solo 401ks. And that is because unlike with those which have a written exemption for debt finance income tax, which is a part of UBIT, IRAs without having to structure the investment a certain way are again exposed to this particular type of tax in, a, in, a, in, in more ways than, than 401ks would be. But 401ks, and solo 401ks and qualified retirement plans can still be subjected to UBIT if they invest into some type of active trader business that's not structured as a C-Corp. So if you're investing in some type of, let's say, pass-through entity, and this can be limited partnerships, this can be LLC membership interest that is engaged in an active trader business that's not, again, taxed as a C-Corp, and I'll get into why that is in a minute, those UBIT liabilities can pass through to the investor. And if you are a tax exempt or a tax sheltered, um, any tax sheltered type of entity, then uh, unfortunately you would then be subjected to the UBIT taxes that are going to be passed through. So, with that said, you can exempt an IRA from UBIT if it is investing into a C-Corp. So if you do want to go out and let's say the ultimate end goal is to buy some type of active trader business. So again, that coin laundromat, that dry cleaner, something like that, looking into whether or not structuring the investment vehicle as a C-Corp rather than a pass-through is going to definitely be something you're going to want to give a lot of credence to because when you invest into a C-Corp, the IRS is saying, okay, well, this entity is going to go ahead and elect to be taxed at the corporate level, and then the ultimate investor passed, the ultimate investor income is just going to be taxed at the rate at which those investors are taxed anyway. So IRAs being tax exempt, uh, any other type of organization, there's no additional tax burden that needs to be passed through to make sure there's no, you know, kind of quote loopholes in the system that would allow for, you know, an active trader business to operate in the normal scope of the business market without having to be you know taxed at any at, at any appreciable rate so with that said again if you want to invest in an active trader business or something again that is um, you know kind of a point of sale transactional structure trying to see if you can tax you can elect to have that entity taxed as a c-corp would automatically kind of stand in as a blocker for UBIT. Now, what is considered investment income? Income that is generated from uh, rental real estate, note interest, uh, royalties, capital gain income, uh, and, and certain things are going to be exempted from UBIT and you would need to look at Internal Revenue Code 512B to look at that. So when you're looking at pass-through income from an active trader business or investment income, those again are two different buckets that you can look to um, 
being exempted from these types of taxes. Let's see. Uh, no, this is this is the correct slide, Brad, that I'm I've been focusing on here for a moment. Um, uh, one person said they had any ha having an issue with sound. Uh, can someone please confirm that you can hear me correctly? And I'll go back and we have a few questions. I'll get through if someone can just confirm they can hear me. Okay, we can hear me. Great, fantastic. Yeah, for the person that couldn't hear me, unfortunately, um, it looks like it's something on your end. Uh, so let's go ahead and answer a few questions before we kind of get into the next slide because we got a couple here. I want to make sure they don't pile up. So let's see, I have a client who uses self-directed IRA funds to purchase a rental property and do renovations on it before putting it into use. However, they didn't have enough to cover all the renovations and put about 20,000 personal funds in as well. Trying to figure out if that can be considered part of the initial partnering or if they have outright caused a disqualifying transaction in their IRA at this point. Uh, Melissa, I would say contact me directly on that one. That one definitely is a bit of a more real specific um, situation and I would hesitate to kind of answer that um, with something that needs to be dug into a little bit further um, on a uh, recorded webinar. Uh, not that I don't want to answer it, but it's just something that needs a little bit more context and I'm certainly happy to uh, dig into that a little bit more specifically um, uh, for your for your use case with your client. Uh, let's see, we have someone, please describe how multifamily residential rental business uh, owned by a self-directed IRA and solo 401k can trigger you, but um, I think that question is going to be kind of answered in the next few slides that we get into. So maybe hold on to that. And I think that will be kind of answered in due course. Uh, let's see, my LLC receives rental income only, no employees, but I do pay a lawn maintenance and repair people in this account. I think you're fine on that. Um, you know, if your IRA owns a, a wholly owned LLC uh, and it just owns rental real estate and you're just paying for basic maintenance and upkeep on the property, I don't necessarily see that as being a problem. Uh, I really wouldn't be any different than an IRA owning the property directly and just having to pay lawn maintenance and everything else. I haven't seen any clients run into particular issues from that specific use case. Again, you're not operating necessarily a business. You're just maintaining the asset of the IRA by extension of the LLC. And, and the like, uh, you know, there really isn't any particular issue with an IRA owning property directly. Um, haven't seen anything like that uh, be a particular issue. Uh, let's see, are capital gains derived from the sale of real estate in a self-directed IRA considered investment income? I thought capital gains didn't apply in a self-directed IRA. Uh, correct. So if you sold a piece of real estate or any asset for that matter, and there was appreciable gain in the sale of what you paid for it uh, to the time of sale, uh, yeah, the capital gains do not apply within an IRA. Uh, when, I in, when I indicate that capital gains uh, would be considered uh, exempt from UBIT, that is kind of the, the mechanism. Yes, capital gains are not considered a, um, a UBIT type uh, liability. So just by buying and selling something, so long as you don't cross the threshold into an active trader business, and unfortunately, uh, there really isn't any kind of clear guidelines from the IRS. So, you know, if you buy and sell three properties in a year, is that considered an active trader business? I would say probably not. If you sell 10 or 15, potentially, you would always, I would always encourage someone if you are looking at, does the activity level of an IRA cross the threshold into an active trader business? Uh, or broker status, uh, that's always something better to, to ask to a qualified tax professional to make sure you're not crossing any boundaries with that. But just on face value of what you asked there, James, um, no, it, it, I, so, well, excuse me, uh, capital gains do not inherently apply to just a normal kind of point of sale transaction within an IRA. It's all going to be exempt and just considered, just considered investment income uh, that is uh, non-reportable in the IRA. Uh, okay, that was just about screen being stuck. Uh, let's just finish up the last of these questions. My IRA owns an LLC that uh, is entitled to, that owns five real estate, that owns five rental properties. The LLC borrowed money to buy the house. Is UBIT anywhere close on this type of transaction? Well, UBIT, not necessarily, but UDFI, so unrelated debt finance income tax, if the LLC had to borrow money, then yes. If, the, if it is an IRA that owns it, then there is underlying debt on the on the investments, then yes, you would need to potentially get with a tax preparer to see what type of UDFI, so unrelated debt finance income tax liability, would be applicable to that in that particular situation. Uh, can I invest in an already owned rental 
to my newly created solo 401k. If you personally own that piece of rental property, uh, for the person that asked that question, if you personally own it and you have a new solo 401k, unfortunately, that would be considered uh, self-dealing under the IRS rules, and you couldn't convey or assign that into the newly formed retirement plan. You would have to go out and acquire a new piece of real estate um, on some type of you know open market, if you will. Anything that you personally own cannot be assigned or conveyed into a uh, retirement plan that you have. Is filing 1065 partner's return could avoid UBIT? Uh, not necessarily. It has to do with the active trader business. Now, if the 1065 is filed in conjunction with it being a C-Corp and the, and the IRA owns interest in that C-Corp, then yes. But again, just the filing of the 1065 uh, partnership return doesn't um, obfuscate a UBIT liability per se. Uh, if I loan money as debt, would that be taxable? No. So if you're just loaning money out to people, that has really no bearing on UBIT or UDFI. Uh, if I have to pay UDFI every year on the sale of property or just on the distributions, uh, well, it really depends on if you have a liability or not, but it doesn't have anything to do with uh, distributions to the age of 70. The UDFI liability is paid on what's called Form 990T, and essentially it is something that has to be calculated every year if there is a liability. All right, let's see. That takes care of the question. So go ahead and type those in, and we'll keep on moving. Okay, UDFI. So again, I mentioned that there's two different parts to UBIT. Now, a lot of people think that uh, UBIT is kind of all encompassing and they refer to UBIT when they actually mean to refer to UDFI. UDFI is gonna be inherently the more common portion or the more common type of UBIT that anyone ever encounters with an IRA. Most people aren't looking to invest in active trader businesses with their IRA funds. Most people, at least for the context of what we do, are interested in buying things like real estate or investing into things that are going to have underlying debt. Now, the nice thing about UDFI, even though it is a much more common issue for people to run into, is it is a little bit more, is, is, excuse me, is that it is easier to avoid by using the correct account type than UBIT. Because remember, investing into an active trader business that's not taxed as a C-Corp is going to pass on a UBIT liability to any type of retirement plan. It does not get exempted just by having a 401k or a qualifying retirement plan there. So what is UDFI? UDFI is a tax that applies to profits or gains attributable to debt that an IRA has invested in. Now, specifically, I mentioned IRAs because it is going to be much more common for an IRA to have this type of debt. Now, an IRA has to be invested into something that has non-recourse debt to finance the purchase of assets. When debt is used by an IRA, the returns attributable to the finance portion are going to be taxable. So let's break this down a little bit. If an IRA is going to be invested into a project that has debt, either where they're going to be invested into a property that they have to directly finance, or if they're going to be invested into some type of, let's say, partnership or LLC or something that takes on debt to acquire real estate. And again, it has to be non-recourse debt, then potentially a UBIT liability is going to pass through. So how do people avoid this? Well, if you are, let's say, a self-employed individual or have any type of self-employed income, you can establish a solo 401k. And solo 401ks have an automatic exemption for unrelated debt finance income tax or UDFI that applies to newly acquired real estate that is purchased with debt. So if you're going to be invested into a project or you want to go out and buy, let's say, rental properties and debt finance them or develop properties and finance them, trying to figure out how to qualify for a solo 401k is going to offer you a multitude of advantages over the similar position of an IRA. Now, in the specific scenario of buying real estate with non-recourse financing, a 401k would not be subjected to that UBIT. However, if the debt plan was used for non-real estate assets, then the tax would apply. So keep in mind that this exemption is going to be rather narrow for 401ks. But again, most of the people that are going to be listening to this webinar or people that are interested in self-direction are inherently going to be invested into real estate or real estate projects. Now, this type of tax, if there is debt on a project, does apply down the road if you invest in, let's say, a limited partnership that taxes everything as a pass-through. If there is debt on a piece of commercial real estate, which most of the time there is, then trying to make sure that you can do it through a solo 401k is going to simplify your life. However, doing it through an IRA, these taxes, and by, by extension, the write-offs and deductions, and let's say 
cost segregation and accelerated depreciation are all going to affect and offset any potential tax liability that an IRA would have. So it's important to understand that just because something does apply doesn't mean that it's going to kind of ruin the investment for a particular investor. Being able to receive all of those, uh, you know, once you've filed 990T and receive all of that back into an IRA and continue to earn and compound things in a tax exempt manner is typically going to put you in a very favorable position when it comes to your end goal uh, or end result with an investment than otherwise doing it personally. Uh, because a lot of people complain that when you invest into, let's say, multifamily real estate with an IRA, yeah, you don't get to take advantage, um, or or real estate in general don't get to take advantage of all the great tax benefits and the write-offs. When you do have a UBIT or UDFI liability, you do get to take advantage of those, specifically with IRAs. The nice thing with 401ks, especially the solo 401ks, that you have the automatic exemption from that. And we'll get into some of the automatic deductions that you get as well for investing in debt finance real estate um, here in a minute. Uh, let's see, let's take care of a few questions before we get on the next slide. Uh, let's see, uh, let's see, rental passive income must be reported on K1 line two. Uh, yes, but that's kind of just referring to how you would essentially uh, be utilizing to calculate any potential liability when you go to file 990T. Uh, let's see, since short-term rental properties are popular right now, I read that some people say that short-term rentals are not allowed in qualified plans. Is that due to UBIT? Uh, no. The only thing that I think that most people get hung up with on, on short-term rentals is most states apply uh, sales tax to the rental income. And when people try to avoid um, you know, taxes and IRAs, not being able to kind of uh, mitigate that sales tax liability on rental income, it can be kind of a hassle. Uh, but short-term rentals inherently are not disqualified from IRAs. We have a lot of people that do them and do very well with them. Uh, would it be advantageous to move an existing LP and real estate syndication investment that is leveraged uh, from my IRA into my solo 401k? Sure. Yeah, I have definitely have had people do that where they kind of start to understand maybe some issues with UDFI and say, hey, I qualify for a solo 401k. Let's move this into that plan, which you're definitely allowed to do. So long as it's not in a Roth IRA, you can roll that asset directly into a solo 401k and definitely be a little bit easier and uh, and take advantage of more of those tax benefits. Um, let's see, I got two more questions, so we'll keep moving on. Um, is it still possible to have a solo 401k uh, for real estate management and have a W-2 job? Yeah, you can definitely have a solo 401k. Um, again, you do have to have some type of external self-employed business activity and still have a W-2 job. Now, again, that doesn't have to be anything as complicated. Let's say you own a few pieces of real estate in an LLC, you've sold, sold widgets on eBay or Amazon. There's a lot of ways to say that you qualify for a solo 401k that aren't super complex. So we can definitely kind of dig into that further if you wanna give me a call. Uh, I usually think of 401ks and IRAs is almost the same thing as one can be rolled over to another. What is the theory from the IRS's perspective as to one's UDFI and the other does not? Uh, that boils down to more of a Department of Labor issue uh, when the fact that if you have commingled plan assets that they didn't want to extend uh, one participant's potential tax liability on investing in a leveraged asset to all the other plan owners or plan participants. So that's why 401k specifically do offer an exemption from UDFI. And do Roth assets not apply to solo 401ks? Uh, so you can't roll a Roth IRA into a Roth 401k, but you can have a Roth 401k. It's a really quirky rule that I don't quite understand, but it's just the way that things work. Um, if I understood correctly, when invested into real estate syndications in which debt will be leveraged by the GP, UDFI will apply, but the depreciation from cost seg and uh, depreciation will help offset the UDFI. Absolutely. And I'll get into an actual case study where we go over some numbers. And last question before we move on, what if a solo 401k owns real estate finance with a full recourse loan? Uh, well, if it is financed with a full recourse loan, then that unfortunately was not correctly financed. Um, any type of financing within a qualified retirement plan has to be non-recourse. So when it comes to paying 990T, your IRA or retirement plan has to file a tax return. And a lot of people are familiar with like forms 1064, 1099, 1040, all these fun little uh, numerical tax forms that have to be filed when doing taxes. So if your retirement plan has to pay a UBIT or UDFI liability, it has to file what's called form 990T. 990T is a 
tax form that has a timely filing date of a given year, typically April 15th. UBIT taxes only need to be reported if the total owed is over a grand. So after, let's say, cost seg and everything else like that, or there's a lot of other things that help offset a liability, and you have less than a $1,000 UBIT liability or UDFI liability, then you don't need to file, which is nice. But again, you'll see kind of how these things work out here in a few slides. Uh, but if you do need to file, it is important that for specifically for an IRA, that you do get a unique tax ID number for the IRA. So when it comes to filing these types of liabilities, you're not going to file it under your personal social security number. The IRA actually has to file it. So it's important to contact your custodian. In this case, if you work with Advana, contact us to let us know, hey, this needs to be done. We'll help you through the process. We'll work with your tax preparer to make sure everything is correctly done and filed because it is an absolute nightmare if you file this incorrectly to have things corrected and get back into kind of the good graces with the IRS. So it's not that hard to file, but doing it correctly the first time will save you immeasurable amounts of time and headache down the road. So just understand UBIT is paid on a separate tax form that the IRA actually has to file or the retirement plan, I should say, actually has to file and it's called 990-T. So here's some different benefits regarding these two different types of accounts and um, some of the benefits to what they offer in the tax exemption and also from you know just kind of the amount of let's say overhead and headache that one might look at with regard to choosing you know is it better for me just to go the ira route or using a solo 401k uh, to try to help with my investment strategy so using an ira some of the pros they're significantly easier to establish than a solo 401k they just require a lot less kind of thought into it anyone can qualify for an ira uh, they're just not that inherently complex to set up and kind of get started with it. Now, the IRA custodian does all of the annual reporting with an IRA, unlike with a 401k. There's no need to validate the IRA like a 401k, so you don't have to have any type of under underlying business or try to make sure that you are doing something correctly in your personal life to make sure that you qualify for the solo 401k account. Um, you can use blocker corporations to limit or eliminate UBIT taxes. So if you're investing in something, you do have the ability to utilize things like C-Corps in order to help avoid or eliminate UBIT tax liabilities. And you can also use deduction, cost seg, and depreciation to offset income and potentially you know, show you know, potentially low or zero UBIT or UDFI for the first few years of an investment. Now, some of the cons, they can be subject to UDFI on tax leveraged income, but they can use depreciation and tax deductions to offset. Profits at the end of a deal can be potentially subjected to almost a 37% tax if you're not using a blocker corporation or if there's not a, an appreciable amount of deductions to offset any type of liabilities. And then there's the additional cost of preparing and having a 990T tax return filed. So the, the IRA definitely offers a more direct route for a lot of people to get invested in tax qualified or tax exempt investing, but the ability to kind of be a little bit easier in the fact of an exemption from something like especially UDFI or the debt finance income tax is definitely not offered to the IRA. Now, looking at the solo 401k, some of the pros is that if you're buying debt finance real estate or you're investing in something that has debt finance on real estate, 401ks are just automatically exempted from it. You don't have to file anything with the IRS to apply for the exemption. It's just an automatic baked in exemption for it. So if you're going to be invested in something that involves debt financing and real estate, seeing if you can qualify or get into doing that through a solo 401k is going to make your life a lot easier. You can adopt checkbook control a little bit easier using these plans. So if you want to be someone that is a little bit more closely administering your assets or the uh, the actions of the account, you can simply lease the plan documents and do checkbook control a little bit easier with these as opposed to having to set up multiple entities or I should say one additional entity with using an IRA for that. You can accept rollovers into these plans from IRAs and old 401ks. You don't necessarily have to start them from scratch. Uh, just like IRAs, you can transfer other tax exempt and tax exempt accounts into those. Uh, and then you do have significantly larger annual contribution limits and the ability to make personal loans with using a solo 401k. Contribution limits for an IRA are going to be six or seven thousand dollars a year, <clears throat> uh, depending on your age of being over or under 50 and a half. Now, with a solo 401k, you can defer up to twenty thousand five hundred dollars of your compensation 
uh, if you're under 50 and a half or up to $26,500 of your compensation if you are over 50 and a half. And then you can also contribute 25% of the net operating income of your business or total compensation if you're just doing it as a sole proprietor to the plan as well, not to exceed $69,000 per year. Uh, so again, a significantly higher amount of contributions can be made to a solo 401k, uh, which is a big interest to a lot of people in helping them to avoid taxes on income that otherwise they would have to pay. And then also you do get the ability of the baked in automatic exemption on debt finance income tax for tax for leveraged real estate. Now, some of the cons for these types of an account, you do have to have a valid sponsoring employer or business. Now, again, you can be self-employed. This can be for some type of, again, slightly more tangential business. If you have sold some stuff on eBay or you have some type of self-employed income or sole proprietor income, let's say you own some real estate through an LLC and you manage the real estate, you can set up a solo 401k for these kind of things. It's not like you need to have a super formalized business and going back to the example I used in the beginning of this, you know, you don't have to run a laundromat with multiple employees or anything like that. 401k accounts can be very distilled down into very simplified terms for people um, that may, may otherwise think that they don't qualify for these types of in accounts. Oftentimes it's easier than you think, uh, and we can definitely help you out to understand uh, how to have that type of um, setup done. Uh, you do need to have some ability to make annual valid contributions. Uh, there can be some additional costs to 401ks, even though you do kind of move out of the realm of needing to file, let's say, a 990T uh, as often as maybe an IRA would. Uh, there may be some additional expenses in having to file what's called 5500EZ, which is essentially the plan report that has to be filed to the IRS. Uh, every year if you have plan assets over a quarter million dollars. And as the trustee of the plan, the owner is responsible for all IRS reporting. We don't act as the trustee of the plan here at Advanta, so you do have some additional responsibilities placed on yourself as the plan trustee with a solo 401k. Now, I don't necessarily say those last things as the cons on a solo 401k to kind of scare people. I want to make sure people have a clear understanding that a 401k is a different beast than an IRA. There is you know, inherently a little bit more that goes into these plans than just a, the, than what people may think. And it's important to, you know, again, with any type of financial arrangement or financial account to understand, you know, the complete scope of exactly what goes on with these and to make sure that you're getting into something you understand and can be successful with. Because the last thing anyone wants to do is, uh, you know, not necessarily, you know, be in full compliance or understand something and, you know, get in trouble later on. Uh, let's see, you've got some questions. We'll take care of these here in a moment. Okay, uh, can you elaborate on what va annual valid contributions exactly mean? Sure, so the ability for, I would say more for the ability for you to make a annual contribution to a 401k. So making sure that you generate some type of income from your business activity that would allow you to make a contribution to the plan. You aren't required to make an annual contribution to a 401k plan. Um, but I would encourage people every year to make at least some good faith effort to make an annual contribution to a 401k plan if you've established a solo 401k. There isn't any kind of hard and fast, let's say, codified rule to say you have to make at least you know X contribution year to year in the 401k plan. You can make, you can go one year without making a contribution, make a contribution in the next year. But what I would say is that you know maybe don't go with it, go to a solo 401k just thinking that you know. I think therefore I am, make sure you do have some ability to actively participate. Whether or not you do, you know, is kind of up to you. You don't necessarily have to make contributions year to year, but making sure that you at least have the ability to do so is probably a good idea if it ever were to be examined by the IRS and making sure that you actually qualify for that type of plan. With that said, you know, these things aren't regularly audited. Uh, we also have a very low audit rate in the United States. I've never actually seen someone be audited with this, but uh, you know, my job is to make sure people understand the rules and are abiding by them. So that's what I mean by that. Uh, what is a blocker corporation? A blocker corporation uh, in the context of this would be, let's say you want to invest uh, your money in a solo 401k or a IRA into something that would have a um, a UBIT or UDFI liability, whether that is some type of real estate project or an active trader business. If you own shares of a C corp, so if the underlying investment, um, you know, you're not buying the property directly with real 
with leveraged real estate, let's say you're investing into someone's project. If that project structure is structured as a C-Corp, then that would block any UBIT or UDFI liability from being passed on to you as the investor for any type of shareholder distributions that are paid. So if they're paying out shareholder distributions to the shareholders of a C-Corp, then even if there was underlying debt on a property, or let's say they were operating a chain of uh, businesses, Chick-fil-A's, uh, coin laundries, you know, X, Y, or Z, then it would not pass on any UBIT because everything's being taxed at the corporate level and any returns to the investors or shareholders would have been already seen as kind of flowing through a uh, kind of a tax net. So that is what I mean by a blocker corporation. Can you get a copy of the slides? Absolutely. They will be emailed out afterwards. Uh, the 5500 EZ deadline uh, for filing those uh, is going to be based on the uh, the plan year. Uh, let's see. Please expand on the ability to contribute to a solo 401k when self-managing property. Uh, that is something that would probably be taking us down a little bit too much of a tangent, but if you wanted to maybe give me a call on that question, I'm happy to go through that uh, a little bit more detail. And is solo 401k required to file 5,500 easy when you file 1065 for the sponsoring business? Yeah, so potentially, yes, it's a good question. So if the sponsoring business that you attach the uh, plan to has to file 1065, the plan itself is completely separate insofar of its investment activities and reporting requirements than the business. Uh, so it's attached to the business, but it doesn't operate kind of necessarily under the same tax reporting requirements that the business does. 5500EZ is basically a plan report that has to be filed in a couple situations. If the plan has over $250,000 of plan assets, so not just liquid cash, but value of the assets coming in, then it has to file 5500EZ. Or if the plan is involved in what's called a ROBS plan, a rollover for business startup, which again is something kind of outside the scope of this presentation. Um, but if you are invested into a ROBS startup type situation, then you would have to file 5,500 easy as a automatic requirement. But if the plan is under a quarter million dollars of plan assets, you're under no obligation to file 5,500 easy for that plan. All right, now let's move on to uh, some case studies. All right, so a lot of times when people, especially for the context of what our clients do the most often, case that people might run into a potential situation where they may need to file 990T is investing into commercial real estate. So not to say that everyone has to file 990T, but a common place that a lot of people might see this would be in some type of commercial real estate pass-through. So let's look at how a syndication might work from the perspective of starting with opening an account, uh, and we're going to use an IRA and then in the case study of actually showing you what the breakdown of a potential UBIT liability might look like, also looking at what a solo 401k would look like. So the basic investment process for Jane in the situation is that she would need to open an account and then work with her account manager to get the investment provider, all the completed documents, uh, correctly name everything on the subscription agreements, everything from how the investor is named. So Advana IRA for benefit of Jane Smith IRA number to making sure the correct tax ID number is used on this. So nothing flows through to her personal social. And at the end of this, we would sign the subscription agreements and wire out the $100,000 to fund the ultimate investment. Going forward, quarterly distributions of $2,000 or $8,000 $8, a year are sent back to the IRA. Advana receives and deposits that to her account, and then the account gains are not included in her personal income, but she would be subjected to UBIT or UDFI on a portion of the $8,000 received back to the IRA because it's a debt-leveraged commercial real estate project. Jane will hire a CPA to provide to prepare 990T and any tax on that is going to be paid from the IRA. So in this case, uh, she has, I guess this was a little bit out of, uh, a little bit out of order, but we kind of covered covered this. But the important thing on this slide, at least, is that the uh, project is going to be 70% leveraged. So if a project is 70% leveraged, then 70% of the income, quarterly distributions, payoff, or return to the IRA are going to be subjected to UBIT taxes. The IRA in this case is going to be receiving a K-1 from the syndication, showing how the income and allocations are going to be applied, and interest income, if there is any, is going to be, subject, is going to be exempt from UBIT. So if this partnership was going to be structured as a C-Corp, uh, then there wouldn't be any type of UBIT liability. Uh, and even if UBIT applies, typically your rate of return is going to be better than conventional assets because you're doing this under a tax shelter and everything else that you receive afterwards 
afterwards doesn't have to be taxed on any future investments. It's going to be remaining under the tax shelter of the IRA. <clears throat> so any compounding uh, interest or returns made on those money going forward are generally going to be tax exempt. So paying the UBIT tax, the IRA files, <clears throat> IRS form 990T, it can be done a percentage of the expenses, cost segregation and depreciation, plus you also get an automatic thousand dollar deduction, which is why you don't have to file if you have a thousand dollars or less of UBIT liability after you run the calculation. So again, that's definitely a big benefit. And UBIT tax is taxed at trust rates, which top out at a little bit over 37%. Losses can be carried forward if 990T is filed. And remember, solo 401ks, qualified retirement plans don't pay UDFI taxes. Uh, let's see, uh, is Jane in an ownership position in this property or only as lender? She'd be in an ownership as a limited partner. Um, so it would be essentially in a position as a limited partner in the underlying investment. But for a good argument there, the individual asked, if you were a lender on this project, would you be subjected to UBIT? No. So if you wanted to maybe, and that's kind of another good way, and I didn't mention it um, before, is that let's say that you want to invest with someone that is going to be investing in debt leveraged real estate. Well, a way to get around that and still get the money to make some potential returns would be to structure it as a debt instrument to them instead of an equity position. So you could lend someone money for them to use on their project and then not have to worry about UBIT flowing in because interest income, again, is going to be exempted from UDFI. So doing something like that, again, would potentially be another way to kind of, quote, block UBIT from coming in because there's a lot of different ways to structure this. And just because you wanna be in an equity position doesn't mean you can't maybe work out something with let's say maybe an equity participation and the underlying deal built into the note that would keep you from being in the equity position that would in turn pass through that potential UBIT or UDFI liability without having to use a C-Corp. So a, again, I wanna keep this as 30,000 foot view as I can because this stuff can get very uh, detail and kind of you can get lost in the weeds really quickly but just to understand some of the basics of how to kind of have the automatic exemptions with solo 401ks as well okay let's get into some of the actual numbers of this because we are kind of getting a little bit short on time again keep the questions coming we'll probably get through this here and have a good time for questions afterwards so the impact of, of UBIT or UDFI on this hundred thousand dollar investment so then again, this is based on <clears throat> this being in an IRA because at the end of all this, if you use a solo 401k, none of these taxes or reporting requirements would apply. So in year one on the $100,000 investment, there's an 8% annual return of 8,000 bucks. The amount of income subject to UBIT is 70% year one, 60% year two, 50% year three because of the pay down of the underlying debt. So the amount of income subject to UBIT on year one is 5,600 bucks. So <laughs> you get an automatic $1,000 deduction. So the deductions, cost seg, and accelerated depreciation that year are $5,600. So there is absolutely zero UBIT liability. No 990T needs to be filed. So after that, the UBIT trust tax rate being what it is, zero, the investor return is a whole $8,000, no tax paid on that underlying investment uh, for the first year because the accelerated depreciation and cost seg completely wiped out the liability. Year two, they get an additional eight grand. Uh, the amount of income subject to UBIT is going to be $4,800. The automatic uh, deductions that year are gonna be a thousand bucks. And deductions and cost seg this year are only gonna be $1,000. So the total taxable income is gonna be over the thousand dollar limit. So it's $2,800 that you have to look at for a potential UBIT tax liability. So in that year, you had to pay 24% or 672 bucks. So after everything is paid, the investor return to the IRA is $7,328. So still great returns that you're making on this. Now year three is going to be the, in, is going to be the exit or the refi of this particular deal. So you have $8,000 coming in plus an additional $20,000 again, and this is profit that the, um, or returns that is being made on the, on the underlying 100,000. So in this case, the, the project sells and pays out. So she's gonna make $28,000 of total income coming in on that $100,000 of underlying investment uh, basis, if you will. So just keep that in mind. It's not like you're just getting $28,000 and losing the 100 grand. This is going to be the profits or the income made on that underlying invested amount. So the amount of income subject to UBIT in the third year is going to be $14,000. <clears throat> now you get the thousand dollar automatic deduction, cost seg, accelerated depreciation, and everything passes through a thousand bucks. Taxable income is going to be twelve thousand dollars. 
again, you're getting kind of up into the higher reaches of trust tax rates. So this year you do have to pay a $4,200 tax, tax payment to the IRS. So the IRA takes back in $23,800. Now in three years, this IRA has taken in 44 grand. The amount of income subject to UBIT, granted only two years you had to file 990T is $24,400. You got $3,000 of just automatic deductions Cost seg and accelerated depreciation knocked off $7,600 of the of the appreciable amount that had to be subjected to UBIT. So the taxable income over three years is only going to be $14,800, and the total UBIT taxes paid over those three years is going to be $4,872. So at the end of three years, the investor return to the IRA that can now be reinvested completely tax-free is just short of $40,000 at $39,128. So again, I want to try to try to demystify UBIT and UDFI liabilities and showing you that, yes, even though something might have to be paid, and if you have you know, a really good exit event, in this case, the exit event paid an additional 20% on the underlying investment, you might have some taxes that have to be paid. But again, it's only going to be on the returns. And if you use or can use a solo 401k in this exact same investment vehicle, you would take home the whole $44,000 instead of only taking home the $39,000. So, and you wouldn't have to worry about any of the taxes or reporting or doing any of this. So IRAs can definitely do this. You might not even have to pay UBIT liabilities depending on how much cost segregation and depreciation is passed through. And if you do have losses, they can be carried forward so long as you are filing 990T. So you do have the potential so long as you have a competent tax preparer and someone that understands this to really not pay any or be paying very minimal taxes when invested into debt leveraged or operational business activities. <clears throat> All right, so let's answer some questions because I'm sure people have some. <clears throat> let's see, someone asks, how can I use funds to purchase property or land in an LLC that I own? Unfortunately, you can't, you have to uh, buy that stuff on second markets. Are capital gains tax at trust rates? Well, again, if you are investing in this type of manner with a self-directed IRA or a tax qualified plans, you're not calculating this as capital gains being paid back. It is going to be income based on, ta on a tax exempt basis. So uh, capital gains aren't really necessarily something that is even passed through or be, would be considered a, um, a, a subjected to UBIT. Uh, would I be subject to UBIT for the interest payments received from the money I lent out for my IRA? No, you would not be. So if you lend money to someone in, an otherwise, in a project that otherwise might have UBIT or UDFI, uh, lending money to someone, the interest income coming back to you is not going to be subject to the UBIT, even if the money was used for a project that might otherwise have a liability associated with it. So lending is a really great way to kind of structure things to keep you from having to uh, to pay that. All right, let me scroll up a little bit. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. What would the capital gains on that sale in three years be subjected uh, to UBIT? Uh, uh, is the subject because other income was subject to you along the way? Uh, no. So if you are, let's say, the returns on your investment, because again, the IRA doesn't see it as a capital gain like you would otherwise if you were personally investing, the IRA is seeing it as investment income. So you can't say that it is being ta is being subjected to capital gains. Uh, it's only going to be paying back to the investor the pass-through of the return on their investment, which wouldn't be exempt. Uh, can you quickly answer how accelerated depreciation or cost seg works? Is that speeding up the 27 and a half years of depreciation into a few years? Uh, yes, I mean, that in a nutshell is kind of how that works. I would leave it to people that are better versed than I to explain just exactly how accelerated depreciation works. Um, and then cost segregation is basically having a detailed analysis done of a piece of commercial or industrial property to um, segregate out certain aspects of the building or structure that can be depreciated on different schedules. Does Advanta IRA refer clients to local CPAs with SDA and REI experience? Yes, we certainly can. I presume the tax advisor prep costs analysis for both types of plans are deductible expenses for the investments the plans are invested in, thereby reducing next year's potential taxable amount. You would need to always check with the tax preparer to see exactly how much or if that is available as a deductible expense to the IRA. So I would always encourage you to check with the person preparing that as someone to advise you on just what the scheduling of the deductions for that might potentially be. 
if uh, let's see, do individual states have UBIT, UDFI, or UBIT taxes? No, this is all federal. So if you do have a liability for this, you don't have to worry about state and local taxes on that. The only time local taxes really ever come into play with real estate as far as IRAs go is if you have short-term rentals and you have sales tax subjected to short-term rental costs, but state and local taxes for UBIT and UDFI do not apply because it is only levied at the federal level. If I buy vacant land, hold it for at least two years and then sell it, would I be subjected to UBIT? I would think not. Uh, but again, check with your tax and legal advisory on that. But just buying a piece of land and then selling it after a certain amount of time, even if you sold it pretty quickly, it's more to do with volume rather than um, the speed in which you sell something. Because if you buy it and 10 days later, someone comes by and wants to, if you sell it, if you buy it and 10 days later, somebody Buddy comes along and says they want to buy it. I again, it's more to do with volume, not necessarily the clip at which you bought and sold something. And the, what is the difference between UBIT and UDFI? Uh, all right, you said UBIT twice, but I think you meant UBIT and UDFI. UBIT is specific to business income. So if you are investing in an active trader business, that is specifically what UBIT is related to. And UDFI is specifically related to unrelated debt finance income tax. So the debt financing portion of a uh, project that an IRA might be invested in is specifically what UDFI covers. All right. Well, I think we have a lot of great questions and we are pegging up right on an hour. So I would... Um, I would, I would encourage anyone that has any questions or wants some more information, give me a call, shoot me an email. Always happy to help on you know taking care of anyone's uh, questions or what they need answered. I appreciate everyone being in attendance today. We had a lot of great attendees here. We had almost 75 people, I think, at the top of it. So again, any questions, feel free to reach out to me directly. I'm always happy to help. My name... Uh, is Alex Perney. I don't believe I can include the questions and answers on the handout because it does include the participants' names and there's really not a way for us to redact that, unfortunately. Um, so due to privacy concerns, I don't think we can send that out. Um, all right. So with that said, I'll let everyone get back to the day. Hope everyone has a great Tuesday. Best of luck with your investing endeavors and we will see you on the next webinar.